Greetings, everyone. It's great to be back. I'll uh, chat for a little bit, give people a few minutes to sign on. I see some people coming on uh, pretty rapidly. So I figured I can give us a little bit of an overview of some of the things we'll be discussing. And hopefully, you'll start asking some questions here in the near term so that we can queue them up. Uh, please feel free to send questions throughout the broadcast. So as I talk about any topic, feel free to post questions uh, into your chat window based on the topic I'm covering or one you'd like to see me cover. If we can find time, I'll be happy to cover that as well, or at least briefly. And we can always queue them up for a future broadcast. And in general, you can uh, send your feedback at any time. So if you have any feedback for us, please let us know if there are any things you'd like to see, topics you have in mind, uh, or things uh, that you would like to see us discuss in a roundtable fashion. We're playing around with a number of different uh, formats, and always looking to uh, challenge ourselves and our technology and see what we can uh, find ways to do right and wrong. Uh, so please uh, don't be shy uh, about any of that. I know it's early in some parts of the world, so if you're uh, sitting there before your computer with a nice cup of coffee, uh, welcome. And if you're about to climb into bed, uh, welcome as well. We have a, a good range of people from all around the world. And hopefully a few interesting topics for you and, and a number of uh, in exciting interviews and discussions uh, with various participants uh, that we'd like to bring forward. So with that in mind, hopefully uh, most of you that are planning to join have, have signed on. And uh, those of you who are early, I won't drag it out anymore. Uh, before we get into the meat of the discussion, I wanted to provide a few general updates. One of those is that I'd like to remind you about the GUE conference, which is coming up in the end of October, uh, last weekend in October, and uh, a great time to be in the United States. For those of you in Europe and Asia and the rest of the world who have not been in the United States during Halloween, it's a great holiday, a really a good excuse to dress up. Richard's favorite is Dracula. Uh, so if any of you have a, a favorite costume, don't forget to bring it along. Uh, it's a great weekend to join us. We have a great lineup, a number of uh, uh, really good speakers. We're covering everything from wreck diving and cave diving to decompression and free diving. Uh, so we really hope you'll, you'll take the time to join us. And then, of course, one of the greatest parts is all the various socials in which everyone gets a chance to meet people from around the world, recommune with uh, old friends, and, of course, go diving, one of the best cave diving places in the world. So I hope to see you there. Uh, as many of you might know that DEMA is only a couple hours away. So if you've ever thought about or are going to DEMA, don't forget to join us only two hours north uh, up in the High Springs, Gainesville area. Another thing I'd like to mention to you is uh, a new uh, release of the Project Baseline logo. We've done some tweaking with that. And after a careful consultation with our project managers from around the world, we've decided to feature in a more prominent way, GUE as an organization, given its longstanding and founding role in Project Baseline, its extensive commitment and dedication to that conservation effort. That, of course, doesn't change our motivations to involve people from a variety of agencies. But uh, we did feel that it was appropriate, especially generally speaking, in many iterations of the logo to more prominently feature uh, GUE as well. Uh, that might vary in some representations, depending on size and format and uh, whether it's showing GUE project baseline teams. But in general, uh, we hope uh, you'll be happy with that. We've also decided to move forward in a more focused way on the Rebreather 1 and Rebreather 2 programs. Richard and I had several meetings over that and have agreed to go ahead and flesh out the Rebreather Level 2 program. We'd like to work with both our RBAD instructors and divers, as well as our JJCCR instructors and divers to flesh those components out and see the full program. Uh, as with most of these high-level classes, there isn't really a need to rush that part of the program out, but we want to flesh it out and get exactly what it looks like in queue. We've thoroughly and rigorously analyzed it from many different directions and feel progressively more convinced that that kind of program is the best for the student and best for the agency broadly. So that would allow for a, a rebreather level one class that's relatively similar to the class that currently is, is undertaken, but then a level two program, which is uh, fundamentally similar to a GUE uh, level tech two program. So if you're interested in those aspects as an instructor or as an avid diver, please don't be shy. Contact Richard Lundgren. Uh, flood him with email, please, everything you have. And sign him up for lots of spam lists. Uh, he really likes that uh, a lot. But seriously, please uh, contact Richard Lundgren if you're willing to help and support that program. All too few people end up actually working in a focused way on any of these programs. 
And uh, so any assistance that we can get from our internal GUE community or those of you who might be joining from outside, uh, we certainly welcome, welcome your expertise and your experience. And I think that iteration will really help develop the level three tech and cave programs that we have a focused uh, workshop and from which at the conference uh, where we're going to start developing that program, assign working groups, and get serious for those level two programs to be released next year. So a lot of neat things in our program development and also some things that I'm going to discuss uh, today as well. Great success with GVTV, so thanks so much for everyone, for your contributions, for uh, especially your membership, your subscribers. We really appreciate your support. We've been really thrilled with the way that uh, that program has developed. Of course, like always, we're continuing the quest for excellence, and so we appreciate the feedback. We're looking for ways to improve it, uh, working for ways to develop it further. And one of those things that we've been uh, ready to get focused uh, with is a commission-based system. So we've been developing that uh, in the last couple weeks and really about ready to release that and bring it forward uh, to the community at large. We will probably initially release it to uh, some of our internal GUE instructors, but if you have interesting content that you're willing to film, uh, please uh, contact us and let us know. Or if you have content that might be interesting and you'd like to get out there, we'd like to talk to you about a commission-based system in which you can benefit our community and also earn uh, revenue along the way. So we're excited about that uh, growing development. We're most interested in garnering content that's finished because we already have our hands pretty full with a significant amount of content that we're in the process of editing. Uh, but we will certainly entertain anything that you have. So if you've got some great idea or you've got it mostly done but you need some support, let us know uh, about those pieces of content as well. Towards the end, I'm also going to talk a little bit about the Scientific Diver program. Uh, I had a chance earlier today to talk with Diego, who uh, really spearheaded that program. He's uh, out based in Portugal, and he's been one of the main spearhead points for bringing that program to fruition. So I look forward to bringing him in and sharing that conversation uh, a little bit later. Before I get into that, I wanted to get into the meat of some of the discussion that we wanted to have about our GUE recreational program. I think we've got some pretty neat stories that uh, we've accumulated, a few of the classes that we've run and some of the participants getting their thoughts and their experiences, uh, I think is pretty exciting for many of us. And so we uh, hope you'll agree. Some of it's, uh, I think, even inspirational. Before we get too heavily into that, I, I'm going to bring Dorada in in a second, and I'd like her to tell you a little bit about some of the recent developments. Uh, a couple of you have heard me in the past uh, talk about how much this program means to me, but really, uh, even before GUE was founded, this was something that I was really quite interested in, having taught in a university setting uh, as really my, one of my primary jobs to pay for college it really struck me how little effort could go into, how much little additional effort could go into training a recreational diver and having that diver come out with quite exceptional capacity given their overall experience. And it was common for me to see some of our academic graduates uh, be touted as equal to instructors in the general community. Uh, so that was really something that always stuck with me and it has taken us a long time to get where I wanted to be but now I'm starting to see really some of the graduates coming from those programs, and, and that really excites me. So before we share some of those interviews with you, I'd like to bring Dorada on and let her talk to you a little bit about some of the exciting new recreational developments. Dorada? GUI started to experiment with the recreational program almost 10 years ago already when one of our instructors, Jesper Berglund, took up the enormous task of creating the whole recreational curriculum for GUE. And what he created by that time, I believe, was the perfect recreational level one class. There was still one flaw to it because the class was 10 days long. And of course, there are people who could take a 10 day entry level class, and there is no question about it, but for majority of people who would like to try diving, it's a very big commitment to dedicate 10 days to something that you might not know if you like. So what is the best approach to make something that is too long better? Probably to make it shorter, but it's not our case because we would like to maintain the quality of training that we are always aiming for. 
So the first approach that we had, we wanted to create a very short program for people who would like to try diving. So they would like to see if they like it or not, and if they like the way GUI is training divers. So that's why we have created a program called Discover Diving, which is just a half day of introduction to diving itself and as well to GUI diving training. And apart from that, if we are looking back now at the full level one class, we do have a supervised diver, which is a class that will teach a candidate for a diver to have all of the basic individual techniques, like good buoyancy, good trim, propulsion, maneuvering techniques. He's a person who can handle the equipment properly, who understand how it works, who can even handle minor emergencies, and even finish a dive if he would have an out of gas situation and safely ascend to the surface, but still requires a supervisor, like Jew instructor or Jew dive leader, Jew instructor assistant. So basically, what that person is missing at that stage is one of the key components of Jew training, which is experience. So now, having that basic skills, which are very solid, he can build on an experience and decide at some point, okay, now I'm ready for it, I'm confident and I'm competent with the basic skills that I have, and then I can go for a full recreational diver level one class. So now, the second part, so the Rec 1, so the full class would teach him how to be more independent, how to be an autonomous diver. So he will learn how to shoot an SMB, he will learn more advanced planning, he will learn to execute the dive together with his team on his own. But now we can have a question, what's the difference? So what's new with that approach? And you can say people have done it before, but what I believe the difference is that we are really emphasizing the key component of GUI training here, which is experience. Because diving is not diving training. Diving is diving. So what we try to achieve is just to allow people to gain as much experience in that activity as they can before they proceed with further training. And we will have the same approach to changes that we are doing to the next level of training, which is REC2 where we will divide it as well into very nice and attractive chunks of training, whether it will be a deeper training involving already use of helium, or it will be a rescue training and navigation training, where a person can decide how to scale the experience that they get and how they can progress to really becoming a very confident diver, because this is, in the end, the diver that you would like to have. Greetings all and welcome back. Dorada's not serious, she's just focused, John. Uh, so I hope you enjoyed hearing a little bit of the updates coming uh, through that recreational program and some of those successes. It was really uh, interesting for me as I was listening to Dorada talk a little bit, my, I was also thinking the same thing that she articulated, which is that from an outside perspective, it probably would be natural for people to say, yeah, so what's different? Breaking up your programs, having some you know, different levels, having discovered diving. And it's very true. We've not intended to reinvent the wheel. So we're not, you know, we're not really looking to try to reinvent completely scuba diving because there's mo many things that are really well done about scuba diving. It's not as if the industry is completely broken. It's just a lot of the incentives and performance levels are shifted in the wrong direction for various economic and historical reasons. So don't fix what's not broken, but refine uh, what needs refinement. And so I think one of the biggest things that we have in, that's different really is ultimately the one thing our, uh, Dorada articulated in terms of experience, but on the other side, very similar to that of the same coin would be capacity. And so it's just important that divers ultimately have that high level of comfort and capacity in order to support our broader vision. Hopefully some of that's gonna become true uh, and obvious to you uh, as you start to see a couple of the interviews that we have coming up. I found them actually quite inspirational, so let's see if you find the same. We'll be showing you first a series of interviews with some of our supervised diver graduates, including their instructor. So let's check that out and see what you think. My name is Omar. 
I came from Islamabad, Pakistan. Islamabad actually is a mountain area, so we don't have ocean. So when I moved to Dubai, I met some of my friends, uh, which were good swimmers. And of course, when I saw them swimming very nicely and I can't do, and I was scared of water. So yes, it was interesting for me. So I start learning swimming and then diving. I joined for this diving class because I know so many good divers around me. That is my motivation and that's how I came in diving. The hardest part for me was uh, keeping up my good dream and then somehow mass clearing was tough for me as well. Accomplishment was that when I came out of water and my instructor Mark was telling me that you're improving and you're going towards better, yeah, that was the most excited part for me and I was so confident that yeah, I can do it. We all should be aware of uh, underwater world and we should know how to take care of that creatures and how to maintain our oceans so i think it's a, it was a good experience and everybody should learn diving when i have to jump from the boat i was so scared because it was like you are jumping in water from the boat and yeah it was much more fun when i did it but it was really a scary moment for me as well that I don't know where I will jump over and where I will be under the boat or somewhere. So yeah, it was a really nice moment for me. I am proud now because I was the person who was so scared of water and don't know anything about water. So yes, uh, now as I know that I am a diver now, I am proud of being a diver and it was such an interesting and amazing thing for me. My name is Nigar Asadova and I'm from Baku, Azerbaijan. Although my city is situated on the coast of Caspian Sea, what prevented me uh, going into the water was my fear of water. Uh, because from my childhood I had this fear and I could never overcome. Uh, so I was too much scared. I was just looking at the water and th that, that was it. After learning swimming, I decided I just wanted to challenge myself even more. And as a big fan of underwater world, I decided to try diving course. The hardest thing to learn uh, was controlling buoyancy and trim. Uh, because, you know, in the very beginning, I was having some troubles, and because I'm perfectionist and I wanted to have perfect trim and buoyancy from first lesson and you know it takes time to get there. You know when you see those beautiful creatures swimming around in peace and when we see them having their own life fluency you just realize that this is another and also very important part of our beautiful world that we must protect and preserve. It's very hard to get quality, knowledge and fun at the same time. And GOE offers these all. And you know, for me as a person who had water phobia, it was extremely important to feel safe uh, while I was learning to dive. When I saw fish first time, well, I was quite excited, but I was trying to show that fish, fish, it's fish there. <laughs> but that was quite fun. When I look back, I see a person who had water phobia and now I can dive. And that feeling of accomplishment, such as I did the impossible, well, because that was my impossible, it's almost incomparable. And I always used to think that uh, divers are special kind of souls who have something in common with fishes, and now I'm one of them. I think this made me most happy. 
So probably the biggest challenge teaching this recreational supervised diver class was the fact that both my students, the moment we started the class, they just started to learn how to swim. So they had a very level of uh, water comfort, which created both a mental barrier and a physical barrier. Um, mental in a way that um, they didn't really feel comfortable in the water. Uh, were even at some point uh, scared to, to be submerged and a physical barrier because they had basically no idea how to move in the water and how their movements would affect the position of their body. I believe the recreational supervised diver course is a useful and necessary addition to the recreational curriculum. Um, as an organization, GOE has the highest uh, diver training standards in the diving industry globally. And it would be unrealistic to uh, just assume that every novice diver would be able to meet the requirements for a recreational diver level one just after a couple of days. And for those divers who cannot, I think the recreational supervised diver course is a very interesting and necessary intermediate step towards becoming an independent diver. I think a recreational supervised diver can contribute greatly to pursuing GOE's aspirations. Um, allow me to give a couple of examples when it comes to conservation. Uh, I think there is no better ambassador for uh, conservation of the underwater realm than a brand new diver who still has this, this very wow effect that we all experience on our first dives or maybe we still experience the first time we dive in a new environment. Um, I think these are the kind of divers that go out to their families and friends and say, wow, this is so amazing, you have to see this. And, and, and that's the first step in, in making people aware of the importance of conser uh, conserving this uh, environment. Um, when it comes to building a global diving community, I think um, they have a very important role because as they are supervised divers, they need to go out there and uh, connect to the local GOE community to find other divers they can dive with. Uh, this can be either instructors or instructor assistants or dive leaders. And by doing so, we might create a new generation of uh, experienced divers who now get uh, the feeling of, of what it is to dive with novice divers and maybe um, uh, sparkle that interest of, of training new divers themselves. When you think of exploration as to boldly go where you yourself have never gone before, I would say a recreational supervised diver is the biggest explorer of them all. For me, one of the most beautiful moments during this course, and, and eventually that's what I do it for, is the, the moment we came back from our first dive, the first time the students got confronted with the, the actual underwater fauna and flora, and they came off the wa water with these eyes like, wow, it's like, this is amazing. And, and that's, as an instructor, what I do it for. I think this course uh, was a very nice experience for me personally, um, and I'm looking forward to have my, my next students. Hello, I'm happy to see that many of you found those stories as interesting and engaging as I did and many of us did during the process. I think it's uh, really neat to see your reaction and also thanks very much to everybody for sharing your comments and sharing uh, the video or sharing the feed with, with people in your communities. It's great to, to get this out and, and share it with other people as well. Those of you who are tuning in late, uh, obviously it's a recorded session so you're welcome to go back. We just finished a couple um, pretty engaging uh, and what I find relatively inspirational stories about people actually who had not even been able to swim, who had a kind of phobia of the water even. And this natural fear of the water not being a swimmer I think is pretty sound and reasonable. Uh, but seeing those people become swimmers first and then very soon thereafter learn how to scuba dive and using you know, our supervised diver uh, instructional program as a way to take these people through that process was really neat and to see their first experiences I, I think was really special. I bet many of you out there can't even remember the first breath that you took off of a regulator 
many of us, including myself, learned to dive at a very young age. I mean, <laughs> learned how to swim at a very young age. Uh, I'm not sure if that says more about what I was like as a baby or uh, more about my mother's motivation to teach me to swim, but uh, I started swimming before I could walk. So for me, it was a very long time ago, and it was really neat to see people progress in such a passionate and dynamic way through those programs. So a uh, really special experience. And I think that if you think back to Nagar's comment, that the really hard part was buoyancy and trim. Uh, you know, she didn't mention all these other skills that we tend to throw into most of our programs. We all know that those tend to be the hardest, but in an effort to get the program done quickly, we pick a bunch of relatively disconnected skills that are important, mass clearing and things like that, but we teach them in a sort of quick fashion while people are negative on the bottom without focusing on the things people really need to learn, which is how to be comfortable and stable in the water. And so I thought that was a really telling comment on her part. I'd like to bring you in now also and let you hear a quick take on uh, Gosha, who took our Rec 1 program. Uh, together with Amanda, we'll hear Gosha's comments and, and see what you think about her, her experiences. Hi, my name is Gosha. I'm 25 and I come from Poland. Uh, I've been always fascinated with nature and I loved water, so diving was a pretty much natural move for me. And my first experience with diving took place 10 years ago uh, when I did my first uh, diving certificate when I was just 15. And uh, unfortunately, since that time, I hadn't had a chance to, to dive. Uh, I had it in the back of my mind and I wanted to refresh the skills and the knowledge, uh, but couldn't really find the right organization and environment and partners to do it with. Uh, so, uh, so I was really looking for some opportunities and fortunately, uh, last year I had a chance to start the journey again with the GOE. I demand quite a lot from myself, so it was uh, always pretty difficult to be satisfied with my own performance, but what I found really encouraging while doing the uh, course, the diving course with the GUE, uh, was that uh, even despite the amount of learning, the skills and the knowledge to grasp, um, I was able to feel more uh, and more comfortable each time I was in the water, uh, thanks to the really great instructors uh, and, uh, and the course material, which was very structured. And of course, I would definitely recommend GUE to anyone who is uh, searching for really top class uh, courses, the kind of apple of, uh, of the diving, uh, diving world. I was always very close to nature and attentive to environmental protection, but what struck me when I was doing the course with GUE was that I really am a visitor, a guest in a completely different world, uh, in a bit of a different planet, if I could put it that way. Uh, so, uh, so I was really happy to, to learn that... Uh, no, we really have to be very cautious while, while diving and we really have to understand that this is a different world that we're just guests in. Uh, and I was very happy to, to know that the GOE is taking extra effort uh, to, to teach the future divers that they are the ambassadors of the underwater world. Hello. I feel very confident that if all of you could see and dive with the individuals that we've just seen on screen with Nagar and with Omar, uh, with Gosha, with Amanda, I think you would be quite impressed uh, with, their, with their capacity and their stability and their comfort in the water. It was really very exciting to see that even at a supervised level, and you know, a beginning level with relatively limited amount of experience, taking people who had no experience with the water at all, at what a high level they could reach. Uh, and that was particularly true at the Rec 1 level. So I think these individuals uh, really help to demonstrate that regardless of one's aquatic comfort and experience, we can really bring people up at a quite efficient level to a quite a high level of capacity. And Mark also mentioned uh, one component, which is you know, ultimately just getting people comfortable in the water so that that supports our broader conservation mission. So obviously if a diver is comfortable, they're going to have more fun and more enjoyment in the water, they're going to be safer, but they're also going to be much better for the environment. Imagining that we talk about caring about the environment and then teach people who can't even hold still in the water really seems obviously a little bit like double speak. So it's really neat to see that development occurring and I hope many more of you in the community will pursue, promote, and teach those programs 
so that we can uh, help to invigorate a little bit the entry-level training. Now I'd like to share one of uh, a recent discussion that I had with Diogo in Portugal. Uh, earlier today, I had the opportunity to talk with him and come up to date a little bit on our scientific diver program. And I'd like to share that experience uh, with you and give you an opportunity to see how that's developing and, and get a little bit of an overview. Uh, when we come back from Diogo, I'd like to take any questions you have. So we're nearing the end. So if you have anything you'd like to talk about, please submit it now so uh, that we'll have the opportunity to answer your questions and, and chat about anything interesting for you. So let's hear from Diogo. Excellent. We appreciate you making the time, and we're excited to hear about this program. I've been excited about it since we first started talking about it. And I want to publicly thank you for the significant effort you put in in driving this along, really spearheading it uh, in some cases with minimal help, uh, and then uh, later with uh, some really focused and motivated individuals as well. Uh, so I think this is a nice iteration and develop for the organization. I'd like to hear from your side. What do you think is the main reason or benefit behind creating the Science Diver program? Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much, Jared, for the invitation to talk about the Scientific Diver program. So the main reason for the Scientific Diving program is to provide tools and capacity for our scientific divers to apply that knowledge into scientific diving uh, programs all around the world. Scientific diving is a tool for scientists and uh, in most cases, scientists lack the help of uh, scientific divers which are capable uh, to operate in the environments on which scientific divers are very qualified to do. Excellent. Thanks for that. I, I think, you know, when I'm looking at this program, it's nice to point out to people some of the differences uh, from my perspective on the documentation diver and the science diver program. And I see the science diver program as being more rigorous, more elaborate, covering a wider diversity of very practical aspects in this scientific data accumulation world, things like QA, QA processes and being run by a scientist in the community. Uh, the doc diver class looks like a really nice precursor to the science class, but you see a, a lot more rigorous treatment. Along those lines, who, who do you see as someone that would really be appropriate for teaching the Science Diver program? All the GUE instructors, which are GUE fundamentals or above, and which hold a BC or higher degree in natural sciences, such as hydrology, uh, geology, archaeology, biology, or ecology, are uh, eligible to teach the scientific diver program. What sort of person might be interested in taking it in a science diver program? You know, what does that person look like and your experiences in teaching them? All the divers which are involved with citizen science projects, such as Project Baseline, will take a lot of advantage on taking this class. So I think those are mainly uh, the, the main ones which would be interested in taking this project because this uh, will give them the capacity and training to acquire quantitative, qualitative and reliable data that they can use to leverage uh, their projects and connect them with uh, scientific institutions. So those would be the divers which would be more interested in taking this program. Okay, so a broad diversity of our community. I think uh, anybody who has been historically interested in the dock diver program would be an excellent uh, participant in a course like this. And I'm very excited to see how the document dive, documentation diver program has supported Project Baseline, as you mentioned, and even more excited to see how this refined technique within the scientific model and within a better base understanding can be supportive. So you've already anticipated my last question, but I'll ask it again just to see if there's anything you want to add. How does this tie into Project Baseline and our global efforts in that regard? The Scientific Diver program will tie off with Project Baseline by capacitating its participants to acquire quality data. And that will open a lot of doors uh, into partnerships with scientific institutions. So that's the main way that this uh, program can tie off with Project Baseline uh, initiatives. Uh, there, there is a shortness uh, worldwide of scientific divers uh, which could dive in the places and the environments 
in where GUE divers uh, dive very frequently. So if we link this passion that we have on GUE divers with the necessity from scientists to have qualified people to uh, take samples from the places that they cannot dive, uh, we are creating here a very good synergy in between the diving industry and the uh, and GUE and the scientists. So uh, it makes me think on that slide that we have on GUE fundamentals where it says ending the disconnection. And for me, this is the true ending the disconnection scientific uh, wise, uh, because we will qualify our divers with tools that allow them to be themselves a tool for science. So a resource that scientists could use. So after this step, we will be able to uh, use a lot of these project baseline initiatives all over the world and uh, leveraging them uh, to a, a connection with the scientific uh, world. Excellent. And that feeds a lot of my motivations in the early years of GUE. So I think probably the most exciting part for me over the last several to five years is really sealing the realization of our communities being engaged in these global conservation and exploration efforts, a huge part of the reason for the founding of GUE. So I want to thank you uh, very much, deeply from my heart, for all your effort, your support of Project Baseline, your great work with building the Scientific Diver Program, uh, and your ongoing support in, in Europe and throughout. It's been a really great time talking to you, great catching up, and we appreciate a nice overview on the Science Diver Program. Uh, get, get back to the university, and good luck with that PhD. I expect to call you Dr. Diego any day now. that sorry folks technical glitch <laughs> so uh welcome back and uh, uh good to have you here i was just seeing if you were paying attention and i was allowing you to pra practice your lip sync ability so i'd like you to post back what i just got done saying uh, the scientific diver program is something actually that is another component that's dear to my heart uh, and really I'm, I'm very excited to see it developing uh, many of you might be aware that you know, my earliest diving, in, my earliest entrance into technical diving uh, involved quite a lot of scientific oriented diving. So uh, in the very beginning, I was working with Todd Kincaid, uh, our vice president and baseline director. Uh, we were working on his PhD program. I'm still waiting for that honorary degree, by the way. Uh, we were working on his PhD work and so immediately confronted the need to manage a lot of the synthesis between sort of volunteer and personal gathered data that could be used in an academic setting. And that really continued to grow uh, on through the program. It really actually started even as masters, then through his PhD, and then ultimately much of the work that we did in the Woodville Karst Plain, all through Florida, and then ultimately globally, really focuses on having volunteers, citizen scientists, interfacing with government and scientists. And for a very long time, it was hard to get any sort of credibility. We've developed credibility uh, through our work over, over many years, but nonetheless, this is a, a new fight every time. And so our goals with the scientific program, our scientific diver program, are really to try to create a strong level of capacity in our scientific divers, trained by scientists, and able to interface directly and efficiently with scientific entities and governments around the world. So this has been the sort of big push that we've been working on. And in recent times, we've been working with NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Association. We've worked with a number of different university and government bodies. And so we're working with them to try to make sure the scientific diver program is properly accredited. One of the ways we'll do that is through the EU norms, and so that's a process currently underway as well, hopefully that will give us accreditation and recognition in large parts of the world. So please look to that program in the future and try to support it where possible. Currently, Diego is the only instructor, but we'll start to change that as the year draws to a, as year draws to a close. He is still teaching that program in Portugal and probably would even be willing to travel, so those of you interested in supporting that program in a variety of capacities, 
or if you have a BS degree and you're a GUE instructor, please uh, feel free to contact us so we can get some more information uh, to you. So I think that's one of many changes that you should see in our programs, and, and I hope that people can identify that we're not just trying to willy-nilly create programs. It's not focused as a revenue generator. It's focused as a way to embolden the organization and develop it in the areas in which we imagined it to grow. So the exploration and conservation initiatives are really the one of the large formational components of the organization. And so realizing these aspects is a very natural evolution and one that we've uh, really been focused on for a very long time. Uh, I have a couple questions and a quick story, a little fireside chat activity, and then I'll let you all go. So hopefully I'm not holding anyone beyond uh, uh, too much uh, appointment or other obligation. Uh, so pull up the coffee or the pillow and uh, let's just finish up. We had a question about uh, how to get someone started. So if you have a friend or a loved one or somebody who's interested in diving and you're trying to figure out how to get them started, uh, I think that a natural choice is to get them into a, a kind of discover diving program. There are a number of them within different agencies. We've, of course, created a DRN, which I'm partial to for a variety of obvious reasons. But I think what's most important is for me to highlight the benefit and the risk of this. So we need to, like everyone, provide an opportunity for people to get some experience with diving. But that experience needs to be generally positive. If the experience is negative, then it can have quite the opposite effect. And so I want to I want to just sort of relate uh, an experience that I had. A good friend of mine uh, told me a story back some years ago now, as I was trying to have this conversation about recreational diving and my sense of where the industry was going and the problems that I saw developing within the industry and how I really thought we were creating sort of anti-fans uh, in the industry by people who were having bad experiences in their diving. And he laughed and he told me uh, a really interesting story that I'll summarize and, and shorten a bit for you. Short version is he was uh, going into a blood bank to give blood one day and as is commonly his habit, he was wearing a diving shirt. So he's sitting there in the chair, arm out, ready to give blood and this nurse walks up to him, looks at him with a big smile on her face. How are you today? Thanks so much for supporting our blood drive and then sees his shirt and then her face turns ashen and her eyes focus and get beady and she looks at him and she says, are you a diver? A little bit nervous, he backs up. This is a woman about to stick him in the arm, lots of sharp devices around, and he says uh, somewhat timidly, uh, yeah, I'm a diver. And she proceeds to launch into this terrible experience that she had in a discovery type program at a resort that she visited with her family. And many of you can probably picture this, having seen some of these things occur, you end up with these large factory production kind of experiences where five, 10, 15 or more divers are being ushered into the water in droves in order to have this great experience, in which case oftentimes it can be and sometimes all too commonly is not a very good experience. And so this poor woman goes off with her group, but very soon she ends up becoming separated from the group. She sinks down into five or six meters of water and she's sitting on the, the bottom looking up at the uh, surface, wondering why she's, uh, why she's engaged in this activity, realizes she's completely alone. She's looking around trying to figure out what to do. She looks at the pressure gauge button, I mean, she looks at the power inflator button and, and thinks to herself, well, if they said if I push this button, I could go to the surface too fast and I could die. Then she reaches down and she grabs the pressure gauge and she looks at it and she sees the needle representing some units of something she has no real idea, but she's told that if the arrow gets to zero, then she'll run out of gas and she'll die. And so she's sitting scared to death on the bottom, uh, trying to decide whether she should push the button and go to the surface and die or wait until the pressure gauge goes to zero and she dies. And we can tell this kind of story in a little bit tongue in cheek, uh, but in the end of the day, try to picture yourself as perhaps one of our super dive, supervised divers. What if you had never you know, really been diving ever, didn't have any experience? What if you were a, a new swimmer, as uh, we, we learned earlier today, and you're sitting here having this kind of experience? No harm, no foul. Obviously, I can tell you the story, and she relayed it. So another instructor happens by, sees her on the bottom, grabs her up, tapes her on. I'm sure there were some beers exchanged later that night. Everybody had a good laugh about the guy that lost his student. But in the end of the day, that has reverberating effects on people, and they have really a tragically negative experience. We see this almost every day in fundamentals classes around the world where people have come to that class because of a terrible or tragic experience. 
Uh, and so I think it's important for us to remember that as instructors, as, as divers, uh, as opinion shapers in the industry, that it's, it's just bad for everyone when people have these kind or even similar negative experiences. We need to cherish the new people in the industry the most carefully and the clo most closely. We need to safeguard their, uh, their best interests at, at every step. So I would say that a discovery program would be the answer, <laughs> now the short answer to that question, but be very careful about how it's selected. I would, I would recommend our program, if that's not practical for whatever reason, then just judiciously choose someone who's uh, really capable and really safe and make sure that experience goes well uh, so they get a good opportunity to, to enjoy themselves. So I want to take this opportunity as well to thank the many uh, non-GUE as well as GUE people that have joined us today. It's great to see a wide diversity of people. As I mentioned at the outset, some of you might have missed. Please be sure to send uh, your questions, your feedback. Give us uh, some topics that you'd like to cover. You know, We would ultimately love to hear all about what you want to see. Uh, we've been talking about some instructional components for this format as well. Uh, so if there is anything you're interested in, uh, if you'd like it to be shorter, if you'd like it to be shifted in any particular direction, please let us know. We're very open and very excited to see you next time. So whether you're uh, heading off to work or heading off to sleep or somewhere in between, I hope you enjoy the rest of your day, and I look forward to seeing you again soon.